Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing our study of the book of Acts, and uh, we're going to pick up today at the beginning of chapter 6. Uh, I believe this is the 6th or 7th episode we've done now. Um, I, I hope you will go back and watch this from the very beginning. So uh, those videos are available at my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Now before we get started in the study, uh, let me ask Brother Ted and Brother Joe to say hi. Do you guys have any preference who, uh, who gets to be called on first today? No preference for me, Luke. Uh, no preference, brother. How do you feel? Okay, all right. I'll probably surprise you then. Okay, uh, well, I'll surprise you right now. Okay, Brother Ted, say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. This is Ted from here in Texas, and my channel is God's Truth Ministries. And uh, I'd love for you guys to check that out. There's some uh, messages on uh, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and some uh, videos for edification of our uh, sufficiency in Christ. So I hope you guys will check that out. Thanks, brother. All right, thanks. And Brother Joe? Yeah, this is uh, Joe with the uh, Sebastian Dresden channel. And I hope you'll come over and sub. It's a channel for uh, teaching and learning and fellowship. Uh, the teaching is what I do when I forget that I don't know much, but uh, mainly fellowship and learning. Back to you, Luke. Okay. Well, okay. I, why do you keep saying that? I, you're, you're forcing me to correct you every time. I want everybody to know that you are quite knowledgeable, and you do have a lot to say, and that it is uh, uh, correct. You, you know, you're not correct 100% of the time. Only I am correct 100% of the time. No, <laughs> not really. We all, none of us understand the scriptures uh, perfectly, but uh, you really do have a, a lot of good insight. So your uh, humility is uh, going too far. Uh, all right, let's begin with uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, and in, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men uh, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Um, all right, uh, Brother Ted, you can go first. I got three verses there for you to give us your thoughts on. Well, just looking at this here, and uh, sorry, my camera's kind of mounted up today. I got to look down at my Bible, guys. But uh, I think the word that jumped out to me there uh, is uh, uh, the way it says it in my King James. Uh, it says the number of the disciples was multiplying, and that word multiplying is what uh, just jumped out at me. And the reason I think that it was multiplying, brother, and I'm probably not going to get past this first verse because that word just stuck out to me, is uh, because of the message they were sharing, you know, the gospel. And uh, uh, every time uh, you hear, you know, you read a verse or something that says uh, the word which we preached or Paul spoke unto them one word or, uh, it, you know, it means message, you know. Uh, the message they were proclaiming, the word which they were proclaiming, it, when they say we shouldn't leave the word of God uh, to serve tables, you know, they're talking about leaving the, the message, the ministry. And the reason that the disciples were multiplying and they were getting converts, as we've seen in chapters past, is because they were openly sharing the truth. And uh, that's what's really jumping out at me. And, you know, Paul said in Romans 1, guys, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And that's what was really, really working in the people there, I believe it. I, I believe the more we get the truth out, the more chance there are that, that, that people are going to believe it. I mean, I know there's this thing in the last few years, I think it's kind of been a failure, lifestyle evangelism. We certainly need to live good and holy and be an example and be salt and light, but until we share the truth, 
I don't think there's going to be any multiplying. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be any disciples made. I don't think people are just going to get it by osmosis. We have to share it with them, you know, in our words and, so, and get down to specifics when it comes to the gospel. And I believe that's what the disciples were going. I didn't, I didn't get past the first verse, but if you want me to go on, I will, but I'll, I'll throw it back to you. I'll come back to you to discuss the second and third verses here after we uh, let Brother Joe uh, speak now. Go ahead. Well, uh, I like what Ted said about the first verse. Uh, I think we had figured yesterday <clears throat> that they were somewhere in number uh, maybe 15 or 20,000 people had uh, become uh, uh, part of the body at this point. And uh, so that's a huge congregation. And uh, they're trying to, they, they've got to have a structure. You know, they've had the, the infilling of the Spirit. We learned last uh, chapter where the rich were <coughs> compelled <coughs> by their own love towards everybody to sell what they owned and distribute it as people had need. And uh, now we're getting to uh, a point where there's such a large contingent of believers in the body, uh, keeping in mind they have no building, <laughs> they've got very little structure, they've got the twelve, I guess that's what they called the apostles, the twelve, that's kind of a neat thing, uh, but anyway, they've got the twelve, and that's about it, and so how do you run, uh, or I don't, I don't want to make it into a business, right, but you've got to have structure, and you can't have chaos, and uh, the Spirit has overcome the, those with, uh, with possessions to sell it and give it to the, to the poor. You know, I was thinking about this yesterday, Luke. You know what I remembered uh, after we, I, it was after the show was over. I, I, I so wanted to include that. I've I got to do it now. I'll forget it again. Do you remember later in the Bible somewhere, and I don't know where, but Paul started taking up collections from Gentile churches to send back to Jerusalem because they were so poor. So somewhere, the generosity of the wealthy uh, went horribly wrong, where Paul had to ask for alms and for donations to send back to the church at Jerusalem. So that just occurred to me uh, out of the blue yesterday. But uh, yeah, now they've got to get some structure. You know, the, the apostles are to be about the business of apostling, right? <laughs> they're at the temple uh, putting their lives on the line, they, and yet there's poor people that need help. Uh, there's daily activities. That a lot of these people have uh, left where they used to live, especially uh, the Jews that spoke Greek, the Hellenistic Jews, are now living in Jerusalem. I've got to imagine that among them are a great contingent that don't have an income. And uh, if I remember right, and I might not, the custom of the Jewish synagogue was to have weekly dispersions of uh, food for widows and those who were uh, without. So I imagine they've got the same thing going on here. And uh, they're trying to create a structure. And I don't think they were belittling, going on to verse 2 and 3, I don't think they were belittling anybody by saying, we don't have time to wait on tables. Uh, I don't think that was a, oh, look at us, we're apostles, not, not table servers. Because who, who did they call for? Uh, they called for uh, people of great character and, and uh, uh, filled with the Spirit to be these table waiters. <laughs> and so uh, it's no small calling, but they're trying to get structure out of what's probably turning into cliques and murmurings and uh, all kinds of problems that, that uh, they didn't get a handbook for. Uh, sorry to babble on so long. Back to you, Luke. Mm. Well, um, we, 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 we hopefully will cover a lot of ground, but in these first three verses, it's certainly possible to, but we could probably spend an hour if we, if we allowed it, uh, discussing these points here. But um, you, you brought up a lot of, important points that I need to uh, uh, discuss 
And, but this also kind of serves as a recap because some of the things I'm going to say are kind of recapping some of the main points that we've made in the previous studies that are important to, to note. Um, so let me let me first. You said the word that stood out uh, in Ted. There was a particular word that stood out to him. But to me, the word that stood out first of all was Grecians. It says, and in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. So um, there's a, a, a real potential problem uh, in misunderstanding these Grecians. Um, matter of fact, I would venture to say probably 95% uh, of the people who read the Bible are, are going to miss this. And that, that, that's why it's a great opportunity for me to make sure this is clear to everyone. We, we mentioned it earlier when it talked about uh, when Peter preached to uh, at Pentecost and the people were from, um, uh, speak, they didn't speak uh, his language, but they understood them in their language. So this is, this is another example when you use the word Grecians and, and Pentecost, Peter's speech, people could very easily, misunderstand and think that uh, Gentiles are already uh, joining the church. But there are no Gentiles in the church yet. It's very important to understand this because there's going to be coming a big scene in, a, in, a, in one of the chapters coming up very soon, or a big argument about, Peter, you preach to the Gentiles? How dare you? We're, we, we hate the Gentiles, and, and there was a, a racism of, between the, 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 the Israelites, the, the Hebrews, against Gentiles, and even more so against Samaritans. They didn't allow any integration, uh, and, and if you married, if the, you had married and produced children the, with the, the Jews and the Gentiles, you, that was a Samaritan, the lowest thing there is. And they, so they, there was no in, integration. You couldn't. You were not supposed to associate with them. You certainly could not share a meal with them. And the last thing you do is think that they're going to be included with with uh, Jesus, the the plan of Jesus being uh, the the Messiah. So um, they had no clue that Gentiles would be included. So when you see the word Grecian here, most people are going to think that these are Gentile believers. They're not. They're just uh, and at the diaspora, the Jews were dispersed. They were all living in countries all over the place, and many of them grew up in those countries, and they never even learned the native language of the, the Hebrew. They learned the language of the land. So these are what historians would call the Hellenized Jews, and they, they are the people that lived all, all over the, the Greek and Roman world, uh, and, and they, they were Jews. They had the faith of Jews. They had the... the uh, uh, maybe even the uh, genealogy of Jews, but they, uh, they didn't speak Hebrew necessarily, and uh, they were not, they were just Jews living in these foreign lands, okay? So that's point number one that's very important to understand. There are no, these Grecians are not Gentiles. Another point that's important to make is that uh, uh, when it talks about preaching the gospel that uh, Brother Ted's mentioned, uh, the there are people today, uh, it's not a large percentage of Christians, but it's enough to create a problem that I, I refer to them as Paul onlyists. Other theologians who have written about this, uh, this group uh, in the past usually refer to them as hyper-dispensationalists or ultra-dispensationalists. But these people, they don't believe the gospel is preached at all until you get to Paul's conversion. So uh, it's important for people to understand, look, Peter has been preaching the gospel. We have four, at least four, uh, maybe there's five, but I'm certain there's at least four occasions he preached, and he preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to the audience. It was He was preaching the gospel. And um, the, the, there were... Uh, there was great repentance of the people. In other words, they they uh, they realized that he he condemned them correctly, that they had rejected Jesus, and they needed to repent. That is to change your mind and accept that 
they rejected the Messiah. Jesus was the promised one. And so they repented of that. They put their faith in Jesus as their Savior and Messiah. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the gospel has been preached over and over again, and with great result. Peter preached the first time, and 3,000 people believed. And he preached again, and 5,000 people believed. And then it says over and over again, it, it says that, and more were added daily. So um, I think, uh, now as far as the um, waiting on the tables question, um, I would say that when you know, when you can see the results that Peter got with his preaching, and, and so far you have John tagging along with Peter, and probably the other apostles tagging along, but so far the only one that is mentioned as and as giving it, being the preacher is Peter, and he's getting great results. So could you imagine taking the, your the, the greatest preacher? This is probably the greatest preacher of all time. There, I don't see anything in, in any of the scriptures before or after this where you have these kinds of results from from preaching. So here you have this great results uh, from his preaching and you're going to expect him to like wait tables it's a total waste of his talent so it certainly is just it just would be ridiculous to think that um, you'd have apostles who have these uh, or who have this gift of signs and wonders and they're doing out the, doing these miraculous things and to assign them to something that is not not taking full use of their talents um, all right, I guess I covered the main points. Uh, uh, and so let's get back to Ted. He didn't really talk about verse 2 and 3, but go ahead, Ted, to give your thoughts on, on anything first, 1, 2, and 3 now. Yeah, amen. Well, um, you know, the thing about those, those uh, in the King James, it's Grecians, and in the New King James, and I think some of the no other newer versions, it's Hellenist. As you, I think you call them Hellenistic Jews. Yeah, same thing. They were Greek-speaking Jews. It even has down here in my margin, Hellenist uh, out of verse 1 is Greek-speaking Jews. And I wonder, you know, as it says, uh, uh, there was a complaint against the Hellenists, or against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows, the Hellenist widows, were being neglected in the daily distribution. And uh, that's kind of interesting, because... Um, Maybe these Hellenists felt uh, discriminated against in some way, even though you know they were, like you said, they were literally Jews, and so maybe there was a uh, uh, discrimination against the, maybe even just their language and cultural differences. You know, maybe oftentimes people from different regions, right here in the United States, would feel discriminated against or not feel as welcomed uh, because of their their customs or their. Uh, their their uh, linguistics, or you know, their type of speech, or their slang, or their uh, uh, you know, someone with a, a, a southern drawl versus someone with a, a northern uh, slang, you know. So, you know, maybe they, they felt like they had a legitimate complaint against the the, the regional uh, local Jews there, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So we see even there that there was still, as you said, you know, not only were not Gentiles included, but I might even take it a step further and say that even some of the outer regions, some of kind, of, I guess maybe the Hicks from French Lick, you know, were were looked down upon, and maybe their widows weren't as as catered to as as some of the locals. Uh, that, that's my thoughts, and uh, and the twelve some of the uh, some of the multitude of the disciples and said it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Well, like I said earlier, the word of God just means the, the proclamation of the gospel, the message of God. And uh, like you said, there's 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 no reason for them to leave that the priority that God has put upon them, the priority of you know uh, proclaiming the truth, proclaiming the word of God. God called them to go and. To the all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't. He didn't call them to do tasks that they that they weren't called to. Not saying that serving tables and, and doing these kind of what others would consider menial tasks uh, not as important because God has a place for every member of the body of Christ. You know, every day of the year. You know, at any given moment. But uh, you know, God called them to do certain things, and that was to proclaim the message of the truth. And they said we shouldn't leave the word of God in prayer. And uh, verse 3 there, my thoughts are, he said, Seek out among you men of good re re reputation, 
full of the Holy Spirit, and and I think that's that's true today when when it, a local church is choosing deacons and so forth. I think that's reiterated in the epistles. These have to be reputable men, men of good reputation, and uh, men, when it talks about ministering, that they would be ministers. You know, the word server and the word minister in the in the Greek, it's the same thing to serve and to minister. So I think we could get something from that, realizing that a that a person who ministers isn't just a person who gets up and proclaims truth, but sometimes it, it is the waiter at your restaurant. It is the waitress. You know, someone who serves one another in love is still doing the will of God. I think that's just a, a practical application we might think about. Back to you guys. All right, thanks. Uh, Brother Joe, I'll give you another opportunity since we've said so much now for another uh, thoughts. Well, I, I think you and uh, Ted have hit on some really, really good points. Um, the, you know, I, I remember from a long time ago, uh, deacon. Uh, deacon uh, is a, uh, a word that denotes a slave that creates a lot of dust. And, and that just means uh, a servant who sweeps. Or I, I think it's just a, a general term for, for a server. And, uh, of course, now in our culture, we've elevated the word deacon to someone of importance, uh, someone who was in the management of a church. But uh, the original meaning was a slave uh, who swept or did common chores. And so uh, that's important to remember. <clears throat> and uh, I, I told you this story once a long time ago, Luke. I don't know if you remember, but a church I attended once uh, was giving a class on leadership. And so they had a book out front, and they said, if you want to take the class in, you know, in, in leadership, please sign up. Well, a friend of mine who was a, an associate pastor there uh, and I decided to go down to the uh, uh, Christian bookstore where we bought our supplies, and we bought an identical book. And in identical font, we had it uh, printed up to say, a servantship class, those who want to uh, take a servantship class, sign here. And we put it on the front table in the foyer so that they were side by side. And uh, and he was an assistant pastor, so he made sure it stayed, even though there was no servantship class. And the leadership class had, oh, I don't know, it was a, it was a church of about 600 people, uh, regular attendees. And I think there must have been 40 or 50 people that signed up into the leadership class, and about three people who signed up under the servantship book. And so that says something about our, our mentality. And uh, and those three people, by the way, uh, Pastor Mike called up to the front a month later and uh, gave some special honor to. But that says something about the, the heart of what's being said here uh, in Chapter 6. And uh, so, uh, like Ted said, uh, serving tables or... Uh, preaching the gospel, uh, they're both uh, equally important in their own right. Um, but you guys covered just about everything else. I mean, I think there was, I think Ted's right, there was a click thing going on here. Uh, those who were natural Hebrew, I mean, the, the, the people who lived in Jerusalem, the Palestinian Jews or the, the Israeli Jews who spoke Aramaic, probably had cliques and, and relationships and uh, probably a good deal more uh, footing or, or importance amongst the crowds of the 20-some thousand people probably who were members there. And the Hellenistic Jews were from all over the world who were new and unknown. And, uh, the widows and, and orphans and, and people without work uh, uh, would not have had those inside connections. So. Uh, naturally, I think I think Ted nailed that. Uh, there were, what were some cultural clicks going on, uh, not unlike other circumstances in our modern churches. And that's all I've got. Back to you guys. Mm. All right. Well, I guess I need to say a little bit more before we move on because uh, the uh, Ted brought up a good point that I neglected regarding this division and uh, thinking that the the Grecians were, their widows were not being taken care of uh, the way that the others were. So I think this is, this is another example 
of uh, why this communal living was doomed to failure. I mean, it was the apostles didn't tell them sell your goods and give them to us and we'll distribute it to whoever needs it. They just it really just kind of spontaneously started doing it out of the goodness of their heart. And but uh, the problem was. Um, uh, man is fallen, and, and our our um, our nature, our instincts are not pure. So we have greed and selfishness, and un, and we're unfair. And and so to me, when Ananias and Sapphira, you know, what they did was, uh, you know, uh, they wanted to hold back some stuff for themselves, and you know that just, uh, I mean, you know, I don't think they wouldn't weren't really condemned for that reason at all but the fact is they there they had a little bit of selfishness and wanted to keep something for themselves apart from giving everything to to the to the group uh, and and that instinct is, is an example of why communism that communal living is is it, it, it was temporary and and here's another example these um, uh, feelings are hurt there's, there, people feel that things are not being exactly fair, or equitable. It's just like in communism. Some people, get, they, everybody gets the same return, but not everybody's contributing the same amount of work. And when someone is uh, working hard and they realize that the guy next to him is not working very hard, but they're getting the same benefits, uh, the, the hard worker says, why should I work so hard? So these are the reasons that uh, this type of communal living always ends up failing. Uh, it's only a temporary thing. Um, the other thing I thought of is that the example I gave about wasting Peter's talents as a preacher and, and put him in there and the serving tables instead was uh, would be a waste of his talent. But it'd be kind of like taking Michael Jordan and pulling him off of the court and saying he should be a water boy. <laughs> I mean, that would be ridiculous. His talent is best served on the court, not not as a water boy. All right, I'm going to read further. We, as I said, I knew these three verses. There's a lot to be said about it. So let me read further. Oh, actually, I want to read them in the, in the Amplified because I, I looked at it. It seems to confirm a lot of things we said. It says, Now about this time when the number of disciples was increasing and a complaint was made by the Hellenists, of the Greek-speaking Jews, against the, the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food, so the, the twelve called the disciples together and said, uh, it is not appropriate for us to neglect teaching the word of God in order to serve tables and manage the distribution of food. Therefore, brothers, choose from among you seven men with good reputations, men of godly character and, and moral integrity, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. All right, now verse 4 in the KJV. Uh, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Uh, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procure, I'm saying Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Uh, all right, so that's verses four through six. And Brother Ted, your thoughts? Well, the first thing that, that jumped out of me there, where it says uh, in verse four, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I mean, uh, the words that jumped out at me is give ourselves to that. I mean, the giving of oneself to something, uh, you know, well, as we know in Scripture, it could be good or bad. You know, I mean, in uh, Romans, unfortunately, it talks about uh, people who had given themselves over to, uh, to you know, the lust of the flesh and to do those things that were sinful against God. Men that had just given themselves over. And then, of course, unfortunately, God gives them over, you know, in that particular text there. Uh, but it, it just talks about the surrender of oneself, you know, giving giving yourself over, surrendering themselves over to the Word of God and prayer. And, uh, you know, the, th the thing that jumps out to me, too, there is to prayer. And the apostles, the disciples, really, really, really believed in prayer. They believed, I believe, that, pr that prayer could make a difference. 
And uh, you know, some people nowadays, and it's you know, it's been throughout history. Some people who are kind of have an over overemphasis on you know, you know, uh, fatalism is, is what it is to me. Uh, whatever will be, will be. You know, the old Doris Day song. Uh, nobody under 50 probably knows who that is, but uh, uh, you know, case or Osirah, whatever will be, will be. God's going to do whatever He wants. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, we're either open Calvinists or closet Calvinists. You know, everybody's going to go at a certain time. Everybody's going to be dead at a certain time. Uh, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Uh, I don't see the disciples, the apostles, believing that. I don't see the early Christians believing that. I don't see the great evangelists throughout history believing that. Uh, and I don't. I don't agree with. That. I don't see that. Uh, I don't see that uh, the sovereignty of God, quote unquote being taught in Scripture to where prayer doesn't make a difference. I, I truly believe that prayer can make a difference. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. You know, I mean, uh, these these guys prayed and sought the Lord. They, they gave themselves over to continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And so uh, that to me shows to me that, that prayer can make a difference. At least, if nothing else, uh, prayer would, is, is giving themselves over to to seek God and to get his wisdom and his insight on a certain path, a certain uh, way of doing things and certain things that he wants to reveal to us from the scripture at the very least. And also I think God can, can transcend that and make a difference in people's lives when, when we pray for them and, and act on it. And the verse five was saying, please the whole multitude. So obviously they got some agreement there and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and all those all those other guys you mentioned there, and whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. I, I think that's uh, more than just a formality. I think uh, the choosing uh, was obviously done with discernment. Uh, there was prayer going into the choice, and there was prayer after the choice, uh, looks like to me. And, uh, and the laying on of hands, uh, I, I think that uh, sh should still go on today. Uh, I, I see. I see that in the epistles as well. Uh, people s associate some of that. Well, if you're part of that, well, you're just part of an extreme charismatic. I, I don't think so. I, I think that uh, there's an affirmation and there's a, uh, a tendency all throughout Scripture to show that there's uh, that there's an affirmation and a, uh, uh, a connectedness when someone lays hands on somebody chosen to a position for leadership or serving or what have you. And when that's accompanied by prayer, and I think that's uh, shown throughout uh, the New Testament as, as an affirmation. And I think there's a real uh, a bonding, if you will, that occurs when, when we're prayed for like that. I've, I've had hands laid on me and, and, and prayed for me, and it's really affirming and uh, uh, consoling and encouraging, however you want to put it, uh, for whatever you have to, to do, whatever task you have ahead of you. So I think these men... Uh, not only appreciate it, but I think it's obviously a, a very spiritual thing, and it runs deeper than we probably can know. Back to you guys. All right, Brother Joe, your thoughts? Your thoughts. Well, uh, I, I like it when Ted goes first, because uh, he, he raised some uh, very compelling issues I wouldn't have addressed at all, and, and his are far more compelling than mine, so I'd like to just hitch my caboose to his uh, train there. Um, the points he was making are, are, are very compelling. Uh, first of all, before I forget it, uh, the one thing that did pop out to me uh, as he was talking towards the end was I'm noticing uh, it says uh, that uh, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and so on, and so on, and so on. They didn't say they chose Stephen and so on and so on and so on and so on who were men of faith and filled with the Holy Ghost it only says that of Stephen and then it lists the other six and so uh, I'm gonna make a big assumption this is the Stephen who will be the the first martyr uh, and uh, and I am assuming that because I don't know for sure but I'm assuming that's that Stephen and so he was spoken of as having great faith and full of the Holy Spirit and so uh, uh, he got special distinction that the other six did not and so even at this point uh, in inspired scripture 
uh, it makes special note of this guy, Stephen. And so that, that jumped out at me. Uh, <clears throat> now, what, I'm going to forget everything else that Ted said. Um, dog on it, I had a really, really, he was saying stuff that really uh, inspired me. And now I'm kind of forgetting what I was going to say. Um, oh, I remember. You know, regarding the praying continually. It's funny because I was just speaking to my mother. Uh, I don't know if it was this morning or yesterday. And she's a real intercessor. She loves to, to intercede for people. She loves to pray at great length. And uh, very unusual. You know, I think it's a special calling for certain people. But I, what, what came to my mind as Ted was talking is the book that I've mentioned before again to you, Luke. Uh, uh, it was a, a, a guy who wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. And uh, he was this Bible smuggler, Brother Andrew. And he was a Bible smuggler into Romania. And he made a case that practicing the presence of God is prayer 24-7. And it's not so much asking for anything or interceding for anything, but recognizing God's presence with you at all times in everything you do. And uh, and and then you, because there's the other extreme, there's the people who say, you know, remember the scripture says, don't ask repetitively, you know, for things, or you know, don't don't enter into long-winded prayers and. Uh, you know, go into your closet and pray, and well, they come out. And the Lord's Prayer is rather simple. It's kind of a two-minute thing. Uh, so there's there's a difference uh, between intercession and and, uh, and practicing the presence of God, which I think is uh, so, uh, uh, something that that we all should aspire to. But these guys were talking about practicing the presence of God uh, more than we would think is. Uh, you know, bowing the head and, and making petition. Okay, that's all I have. Back to you. Hmm. Well, I'll just take a second. That uh, we've got uh, prayer, preaching, and serving uh, mentioned as uh, things to do. So, if you're wondering what to do, <laughs> these are some suggestions. Uh, following the examples of the the early church. Uh, uh, get busy praying, get preach, get busy uh, preaching the gospel, and uh, serve other people. Uh, wash some feet. Okay, so here's a, I'll read a little further here. Uh, verse 7 in the KJV. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Uh, and Stephen full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Uh, then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Uh, Then they suborned men, let me look at that in 11, then to attack him another way they secretly instructed men to say, it says in the Amplified, we have heard this man Stephen speak blasphemous, slanderous, sacrilegious, abusive words against Moses and against God. So that's the Amplified's uh, translation of that verse 11. Uh, so let me, oh, I'll stop there after verse 11. So we did um, verse 7 through 11. Brother Ted? Well, it's, it's, it's an amazing passage of Scripture there where, you know, uh, in verse 7, uh, the first word in my new King James is then. I think the first word in the King James is and. But, you know, that obviously is... is piggybacking off what was said previously, where it says, uh, you know, uh, they prayed, uh, prepared with prayer, you know, and, and, and devoted themselves to the Word of God, serving. 
And it said when all these things happened, then, or and, the word of God spread. So there's a sequential order. And I think great evangelism and great conversions and and uh, all starts with spirit-filled men praying, uh, getting into the word, being given over. You know, I talked about earlier in those passages, given over to the word of God and the prayer. And uh, I think we could learn from that. Like you said, what did you say? Prayer, preaching, and serving. You know, three things that the early church observed there. And there was obviously great results that came from that. And uh, But we see here in the passage that you just read, uh, when there's great results, results come from uh, prayer, preaching, and uh, you know, being surrendered to the Word of God and serving. Uh, then there's going to be opposition. And that's really tragic because Stephen, obviously full of faith and power, it says, did uh, great wonders and signs among the people. And there arose uh, some, and there's always going to be uh, some that arise in opposition. I mean, Satan's got his opposition people out there everywhere to this very day, always has, always will, until he's uh, destroyed. But uh, Stephen, they, they were disputing, you know, they were disputing it. And I, you know, I try to read uh, last several months and last year or so, I've, I've been reading through Proverbs, and there's always, there's always an opposite. There's always, you know, the God side, the, the God's way of doing things, and, and evil and carnality and the flesh way of doing things, and Satan's uh, the Lord of all that. And so there's obviously there's opposition, but uh, they and there's there's disputations. They were disputing with Stephen down there at the end of verse. Uh, uh, nine it is, uh, disputing with Stephen, but they were not, it says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And it goes on to say, you know, you know, they, they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke, so what are they going to do? We're just going to raise up opposition to just, just hang him, or just, you know, or we're, they're going to stone him, but, uh, you know, get rid of him. It's obviously happening then, it's, it's, uh, it's happened throughout all history. Uh, look at the Inquisitions. Uh, they can't resist the truth of the Word of God when, when people would resist uh, what was going on in the Dark Ages and the, Inquis and the Inquisition and so forth. Uh, you know, John Huss, Martin Luther, Tyndale, Wycliffe, all these guys who wanted to get the truth of the Word of God out to people. And yet there's opposition. Well, you know, they can't resist the truth of the Word of God. You know, what's here and what God had given them. So they'll just resist the people and get rid of the people, and uh, we'll just silence them. Uh, we see that today in our in our U.S. mass media and all its forms, academia, uh, you know, entertainment industry, so forth and so on. So they couldn't resist the words and spirit by which he spoke. So they'll just do what? They'll just uh, make up lies, just like they did about Christ. We heard him say this, you know. So the opposition, it's always a false narrative. We can, they can't oppose the truth, so we'll just raise up enough people to speak against it and raise up opposition to the truth. And we know that the father of lies is always opposed to the truth. So back to you guys. All right. Brother Joe? Well, uh, I will note that uh, who needs a memory when you have good intuition? This is the Stephen that will be stoned, obviously. Uh, uh, I didn't. I don't pre-read. I'm sorry, guys. But yeah, I was right. Uh, you know, I what 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 jumps out at me is is first of all going back to verse five when he was when Stephen was spoken of as full of the Spirit and and uh, and faithful. And here uh, it says again, full of of faith and power. So uh, I think the word faith here would be better served. Uh, with the word faithful, Stephen was faithful, and uh, and he went out, and, and it wasn't just the apostles doing the great signs and wonders. Here's Stephen, a, a table server, you know, a deacon, a, a slave, a servant to the to the body, and uh, he wasn't only uh, administering who would serve tables. Uh, obviously, he was uh, being faithful. And and uh, and went out and, and uh, full of the spirit, doing great wonders. Well, that sounds like an apostle, but he's just a guy. He's just a guy who's very faithful and full of the spirit. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that'll get you into trouble, won't it? 
it sure it's, it looks like it's coming for Stephen because he's made such an impression and evidently influenced enough people where they're not only after the apostles or, or Peter and John, but now they've got their targets set on Stephen. So I think uh, even more than the other ten apostles, Stephen is causing the leadership at the synagogue trouble. And uh, so much trouble, or so many converts, that uh, now they're got, you know, where they couldn't lay hands on the apostle or John and Peter, it looks like they, they're not so afraid of uh, Stephen and him not being one of the twelve. And so uh, trouble's coming. Back to you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they were told to select seven men. And with uh, with all these great qualities, and Stephen was among them chosen. <coughs> so they certainly did choose well in Stephen's case. I don't know what became of the others, <coughs> but uh, in Stephen's case, we know that uh, he gives one of the greatest uh, sermons uh, in the Bible, and, and and then he becomes the first martyr of the church. Um, Chapter seven is is his sermon, and it's uh, it's a uh, probably if someone wanted a, a a concise history of the Bible, <laughs> you know that's that's his his sermon. He just gives a complete history of uh, all the things that have happened, but leading up to this this moment, and um, so they they chose well when they still chose Stephen, and he'll always be remembered, uh, and and hold that that uh, be on that pedestal as the first martyr um, but it's also interesting how they uh, they said they suborned it's like suborning perjury I think is a, is a is a legal term it's you you convince people to lie about something uh, in, in their testimony about someone so that's what they're doing they're uh, they're making up lies about him because they want to get rid of him, and they need to come up with some kind of grounds to get rid of him. And that, that's again, that's what Brother Ted said. This is the same kind of thing that happened with Jesus. You know, they, when they put him on trial, they brought in a lot, a lot of false witnesses, and um, those witnesses really didn't uh, accomplish uh, anything really against Jesus. So, it was, but Jesus, in his own words, confessed that, yeah, it's true. I claim that I'm God. And and that's when that's when they uh, kind of just tore his clothes and said this is blasphemy. We heard it from his own mouth. So um, the the witnesses didn't do any good against Jesus, but Jesus confessed he is God. And in Stephen's case, uh, it's the same old thing. You know, they, they, they're, it's so dishonest. Um, but the thing is, the uh, we we mentioned I think in the last study how. We were amazed that the 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 results of Peter's preaching, and so, and, and uh, so far the only pre preaching we actually hear we have rec recorded in Acts is Peter. Uh, but it does say the others were all preaching. But but uh, the ones that are actually recorded, so we know exactly what was said, is is Peter's speeches, and I think he he uh, we have four or five of them uh, recorded that we've covered already. Um, but the results that he got were the greatest in history. Uh, uh, and and the, the amazing thing is the Jewish religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, Caiaphas, and, and his crew, um, they kept on grabbing Peter and John, taking them aside, and threatening them, and putting them in jail, and even beating them. And, uh, and all the while... In the, particularly in the last uh, last case, they ended up admitting that the miracle is legitimate. They did a legitimate miracle. No one can question it. So Brother Joe and I were just amazed. How is it possible for someone to admit that this is a legitimate miracle? Uh, and then they, but they, they say, I, I, I'm going to ignore it, and we can't accept it, and, and we can't be converted ourselves. So everybody's being converted except these stubborn uh, religious leaders who just refuse to accept the truth. And this, this seems like this is more of the same happening here with Stephen. 
uh, let me uh, let me read further here. The um, I think I can read through the remainder of the chapter here and get our final thoughts on it. And, um, verse twelve, and they stirred up the people. Oh, I'm, let me start with eleven. Then they suborned men who had said, "We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God." And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked looking steadfastly on him, saw his face, and it had been the face of um, his face as it had been the face of an angel. Uh, so those remaining verses here, we only have a few minutes before I'm going to have to close the, the study here. So let me briefly get uh, each of your thoughts on that. Uh, Brother, uh, Brother Ted first. Well, uh, I forgot to mention this earlier, and I think one of the... Uh, one of the reasons that there was such a uh, such as stirring up of the uh, elders and the scribes to where they were, you know, so resisting to Stephen, I forgot to mention back up in verse seven, and it ties into what you were talking about them being so close-minded and so, you know, obstinate and opposing to Stephen. There was because at the end of verse seven where it says the word of God spread and a, a number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. A great many of the priests were, uh, were obedient to the faith. And wow, you know, uh, that just, that just to me like, uh Oh, you know, they're getting some of our own, they're converting some of our own. So that's, that's one of the big things that jumped out at me that I forgot to mention that, that, that probably made them even more, more jealous that, uh, there were converts from their own crowd going over to their side, the apostle side. All right, Brother Joe. Yeah, I missed that. Uh, what Ted said is pretty important. Uh, I, I missed that completely. Yeah, that's that would explain a lot. Uh, the, the start you start uh, converting uh, the guys in in the in the uh, snake pit, and and there's going to be real trouble. Uh, so. Uh, that's a that's a big deal, and Stephen must have really uh, been anointed prior to his uh, speech that you were talking about that's coming up, uh, and and again uh, says signs and wonders were following him, uh, much the same as the apostles, and so uh, yeah, that would be the the emphasis for all this, and so. How do you close your ears when the guy sitting next to you uh, may become a believer? And so, uh, you know, it, it doesn't escape me either that the, the witnesses were false witnesses and uh, they're hearkening back to the law. You know, uh, he's saying things against Moses. Well, Christ uh, came and, and that was the accusation against him also, uh, in addition to claiming to be God, that. Uh, he was a subordinating Moses, so um, yeah, this is the, this is a big deal right here, and um, I, I don't have anything further to say right now. All right, let me uh, let me ask each of you to do something very difficult because of my time limitations here today. I want you each to take no more than one minute and and make cover emphasize whatever you think is the main point of the study today, Brother Ted. Well, amen, brother, and thank you. Um, I think the main point is, uh, you know, the fact that uh, the preaching of the Word of God is preceded by prayer, always, that the, that the disciples believed in prayer, that they really, really believed that prayer would change things, that, that prayer could, could change the heart of God, you know. You have not because you ask not. And Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. These disciples are obviously following that uh, command, and... Uh, uh, Prayer changes things, and the Word of God is the power of God unto salvation. And it's obviously true, and uh, men full of the Holy Spirit uh, 
can proclaim the word of God and great things can happen. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Brother Brother Joe. Your final thoughts. Well, before I uh, comment on the chapter as a whole, uh, I want to comment on something I missed uh, on the last verse. Uh, it says that, uh, and uh, all that sat in the council looking steadfastly upon him, being Stephen, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, and, and it's not talking a, a messenger or pastor. Or something. It's talking about an angelic being, I think. He must have had a glow, or he must have had a, 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 a radiance uh, to his countenance that was noticeable to the point of including it in Scripture. And so uh, he was certainly was uh, moving uh, in signs and wonders. Uh, and I, I wonder if today, because he wasn't a, an apostle, I wonder if today if someone was so close to God and so faithful like uh, Stephen was, uh, and filled with the Spirit, if someone wouldn't have a continence uh, that would people would say, gee, the guy looks almost angelic, you know, and, and catch someone off guard. And I, I spoke of uh, my friend John, who uh, just sometimes would sit in a restaurant. And, you know, I heard many stories, but the one I was there for, a group of girls stopped their swearing and, and turned around and apologized to John for their for their evil speech, not knowing him, not knowing anything about him, not even seeing his face really because they had their backs to him, or he had his backs to them in the booth. And so uh, I wonder if you can be so filled with the Spirit and so close to God that uh, we couldn't experience a, a Stephen moment today. Uh, I guess I guess it's possible. Again, he was not an apostle, so this is just a guy. Uh, as to the rest of the book, uh, one of the things that I come away with that I, I noted here is that uh, wouldn't it be great if the church today uh, took the place of the state, you know, for believers, uh, and and instead of welfare programs, we had. Uh, alms and giving programs for those who were willing to be ministered to with the gospel. Uh, I know that there are missions and things for the homeless that, that uh, operate in that way, but wouldn't it be good if, if we had more churches that uh, invested more than one or one and a half percent of their uh, gross annual product to uh, giving uh, to people who were willing to uh, listen to the gospel and, and disciple if they became saved. And the other note that I made here is that... Right, you know, I, 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 I've got to stop. You've used up all the time I was reserving for the gospel message. I only have less than a minute. i got to leave. So I'm going to, sorry, I have to just make this uh, uh, short gospel message and then, and then end it. Um, most people think that they, in order to go to heaven, it's, it's uh, attained uh, as a reward for good behavior. If you become a religious person especially, join a religion, uh, strictly follow a set of religious rules, and if you do well enough, God will let you into heaven. But the Bible says that's not the way to get to heaven. Uh, if that's what you're trying to do, it's doomed to failure. The Bible says there is one way to get to heaven, and it's simple and easy. Uh, heaven is offered to you as a free gift from Jesus. You simply put all your faith in him. No longer put your faith in yourself and your ability to be religious. Put your faith in him instead. And when you put all your faith in him, he gives you heaven as a free gift. Okay? Uh, so Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He died for our sins on that cross. Sins are all paid for. He raised himself from the dead, proving his claims are true. He is God and Savior. Put your faith in him now and you're assured you will go to heaven because of Jesus Christ. Okay, brothers, uh, thank you for participating again today, and hopefully it'll work out. Uh, we'll do this again tomorrow. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.